Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. A warm welcome to you from Ram Mohan Roy, Rear Press Letter 50 Society. So today uh, we are having a webinar on Ram Mohan. So the topic for today is Sati, between advocate and opponent. So we have two very nice speakers over here. So, uh, and today our host would be Professor Rosinka Chaudhary, who would be chair. I'm handing it over to Professor Rosinka Chaudhary to carry on the meeting. Thank you so much, Amit. So welcome everybody to the monthly seminar on Ram Mohan Roy, organized as Amit said, by the Ram Mohan Roy Reappraisal at 250 Society. Uh, we've been uh, organizing these seminars in this year leading up to the 250th year of his birth. Um, and the objective has been really to help us to reevaluate and remember the astonishing and invaluable contribution that Raja Ramhun Roy made to our existence as modern Indians. Um, and we've been very lucky in having some of the most distinguished scholars in the field accept our invitation to speak on Ram Mohan. And no doubt this is facilitated by the forced recourse to online modes of meeting due to the pandemic, one of the very, very few good things to have come out of our experience of it. Uh, because starting from May 2021, we've had speakers uh, as varied as Rudrang Shumukhaji, Faisal Devji, Lynn Zastupil, Dermot Killingly, and Brian Hatcher. And they have delivered lectures on Ramon every month from May onward. Besides the speakers themselves, every speaker has had the benefit of an extensive discussion initiated by another scholar in the field. And in this sphere, we have heard from another galaxy of researchers. Um, and uh, some of the names in this uh, uh, field include uh, Michael Fisher, Omio Shin, Rahul Govind, Shudipto Shen, and Milindo Banerjee. Um, videos of our previous events are available on the YouTube site of the Brahmo Shamaj, uh, and Omit can uh, sort of provide details of that if uh, necessary, right, on, on, on chat. So this, this particular seminar today, we have planned our December 2021 seminar on the 5th of December to coincide with the declaration by Lord Bentinck on the 4th of December 1829, banning the practice of Sati in India. And who better could we have wished for as a speaker on this day than Paul Courtright, who has been working on a magnum opus on the subject for these last few years. I was first put in touch with him through uh, Brian Hatcher um, around December last year, I think, when Brian emailed to introduce us to each other. And we exchanged a few lengthy emails um, on uh, uh, sort of some questions that Paul had. And um, we each of us weighed in with um, uh, what we thought uh, um, on, on the subjects that um, were being uh, uh, sort of discussed. Just a sort of, you know, tiny angle facet uh, uh, into the, uh, you know, the larger work, I'm sure. But let me now, therefore, it's a great pleasure for me now uh, to introduce Paul Cotright formally for the seminar in his own words. Uh, this is what Paul asked me to say as an introduction. So Paul Cotright's interest in and affection for India goes back over 50 years. In 1964-65, he spent a year as a tutor in English at Ahmednagar College as part of a study servicer program through his undergraduate college. That year offered opportunities for travel around the country, including a few days in Kolkata during Durga Puja. He pursued graduate study in religion at Yale and Princeton universities. His first academic project in India came a few years later with research on the Hindu deity Ganesha and the festival traditions that took place in Maharashtra. He didn't actually mention the name of the book, but I should add here that the book was titled Ganesha, Lord of Obstacles, Lord of Beginnings, and it was published by Oxford University Press in 1985. His current project is tentatively titled The Goddess and the Dreadful Practice, and it is an inquiry into the traditions around Sati as the goddess and Sati, the immolation of the wife with her deceased husband, with particular focus on its colonial context during the early years of the 19th century in Bengal. He recently retired from faculty at Emory University, where he spent 30 years teaching courses in the comparative study of religion. Now, Paul stopped there, but I thought I should also mention, uh, because nowadays this is all available, uh, of course, on, on, the, on the internet. Um, and there I found that he's also, of course, co apart from the fact that he's co-editor of 
from the margins of Hindu marriage, essays in gender, culture, and religion. This is Oxford, 1995. And, and apart from the fact that he's written various articles in the Encyclopedia of Religion. Uh, I was intrigued to learn also that he's conducting research on the role of sat satire and caricature in late 18th and early 19th century India. Now, I would love to hear a little more later, perhaps in question answer. Uh, but today's talk is titled Sati Between Advocate and Opponent. Welcome, Professor Cortright, and over to you now. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and uh, have an opportunity to uh, <coughs> uh, look again at uh, this uh, remarkable uh, gentleman, Ramohan Roy, and uh, is a, a figure of such complexity that uh, uh, one never feels like you got it all. <laughs> so I, I hope uh, those of you who know much more about Ramohan's life and context than I do will be helpful in uh, uh, my, my own, expanding my own understanding. Uh, let's start with the, the uh, cover, uh, Amit, if you... Yeah, sure. And then uh, perhaps the slide number two. There, that's just the uh, title page. <laughs> no, we need to go back. Uh, there, yeah. The uh, one of the things about the the whole phenomenon of sati that continues to strike me is the. The, the sort of polarities on the on the image on the left, which is actually from Rajasthan, but uh, <clears throat> shows uh, uh, the uh, the goddess uh, Sati uh, as as sort of being in charge of uh, of this uh, convergence of the uh, uh, what I th am thinking is the the long tradition of the of Vedic fire sacrifice on the one hand and the goddess tradition on the other, and they are sort of fused together uh, in this icon. Uh, the one on the right uh, is, uh, uh, represents the, um, uh, the colonial uh, perspective, uh, at least, the, uh, and, and we will have another example of that uh, in a subsequent slide. But I wanna begin with uh, the next one. Um, The next uh, image. There we go. Um, <clears throat> some years ago, when I was first getting interested in uh, uh, the whole uh, issue of sati and what does it have to do with uh, Hinduism and what does it have to do with religion, uh, I came across uh, this remarkable story that uh, Veena Majumdar, uh, who's I'm sure a very familiar face uh, and life uh, for those of you, especially in in Bengal, uh, she wrote a, a short article simply titled Comment on Sati in the journal Signs, a journal of women in culture and society. It was at that time a fairly new journal in the United States, uh, publishing um, articles around issues of, uh, of gender activism uh, and uh, social analysis. So she published this uh, short piece uh, in 1978. And she tells this story about her family. She said, my great, great grandmother, she writes, performed sati shortly after the law banning it had been passed. So that would put it in about 1830 to 35, probably. It was a rare illegal act for a generally law abiding family that set a high premium on discipline, conservation of traditional values and social obligations and that attached very little value to irresponsible individual freedom. I'm quoting her here. Family legend has preserved three interesting facts. First, that it was the Sati's decision uh, that it was voluntary. The second fact that has come through the family memory as her sons, grandsons were afraid of the legal consequences and tried to persuade her she says, rather humbly and failed. And the third fact, the only resistance to the act came from a young granddaughter-in-law. This was Vina's father's grandmother. 
she refused to accept the sindur from the sati and he thought that the sati should have uh, i'm sorry she thought the sati should have thought better about the risks she was exposing all the adult men in the family should the courts prosecute them for abetting the crime of sati she should have put their safety above her own desire she says direct access to heavenly bliss family memory is also preserved that of the eight married women uh, in the family at the time of the performance of the sati, only one was to experience widowhood. And that was the young rebel granddaughter who refused to be anointed by the sati. Furthermore, family memory has preserved a remarkable portrait of the personality of this same rebel. The other ancestresses had long since faded away. The family preserved a sense of pride in both the act of sati and the one who rebelled against it. Both are remembered as heroines and both the sati and the rebel would have defended marriage as a sacred union. The difference lay in their approaches to their other roles. Conservation and protection of the family name and reputation was largely the work of women. And she writes, the young rebel in this case, who lived, to, who lived on to be a powerful matriarch, managing the lives of two generations and instilling in them a standard of blunt honesty and outspokenness, was protesting against what she thought was irresponsible and selfish. Of the eight married women in the family at the time, the sati was at uh, uh, the time of the sati, only the rebel ended up as a widow. We might wonder if the sati's act of self-immolating devotion to her husband somehow protected the other wives from widowhood. Only the rebel became a widow. She became apparently a woman of strength and determination that left an indelible mark on the family's memory as a whole. The sati is remembered for her courage and devotion to her husband the rebel is remembered for her courage and devotion to her principles of autonomy. Each was both an advocate and an opponent. And Mazumdar draws an insight about Hindu culture, accepting what she calls acceptance and use of contradiction as, a, as different faces of reality. The family preserved a sense of pride both in the act of sati and in the rebellion against it. Now, I find this story illuminating into the way in which sati and its abolition in the early 19th century was regarded as both a heroic display of devotion to the bedrock of Hindu culture, namely marriage. Marriage, the samskara, the perfecting, the merging, not just of the bodies and identities of the husband and wife, but their families, those who have come before and those yet to be born. Marriages are arranged, decisions are made out of consideration of the family as a whole. With the procession around the Vedic fire, the two become one, two bodies, but two bodies, but one self. The death of the husband threatens the capacity of the marriage, the two modes remaining together, dying together, or keeping the self as that they share through the actions of the widow. The widow becomes the protector of the marriage and is also vulnerable to temptations or abuse. Now, sati is an old tradition, exceptional, fraught with danger. The Shastras spell out a strict set of conditions, bodily conditions, such as lactation and menstruation. Sometime, something happened in Bengal in the uh, parts, or in parts of Bengal in the late 18th century of what appeared to be an epidemic of satis. And how do we then account for this? A religious account might include the notion that what was happening was wives were electing to be, not to be divided from their husbands. Uh, this was after all the Kali Yuga, the churning disruptions in the ways of life arising from the dislocating forces of colonial economies and social arrangements. These satis were doing what satis have always done, protecting their families and communities. A non-religious account might dismiss the religious as what in the, in the uh, 
recent uh, administration in the United States was called fake news, namely concealing the truth of the matter, which has to do with greed, uh, women's property, and murder. According to the religious account, the state had no role to place uh, beyond prote uh, yeah no role to place beyond protecting the sati traditions from interference to protect women for sati according to the non-religious account the state had an obligation to protect women from sati they were advocates and opponents in both directions the advocates for sati's uh, uh, advocates for sati and opponents against it the advocates for protection of the state by non-engagement and the opponents for state of uh, opponents of the state for non-engagement. Now, I want to just take a minute to uh, for us to put some kind of visual content onto my other remarks. So we'll look through a series of uh, slides. Uh, so let's start with the next one. Um, some of these images will be familiar to you. Uh, one that kind of startled me at the time. I was the last time I was in Calcutta. I went down to the uh, Victoria Memorial and uh, and came across this statue, which and for those of you who live there, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, and what's intriguing about it is we see uh, Lord William Cavendish Bentick standing atop the story of the sati, and uh, on the backside. Let's take the next picture. Uh, on the backside. Uh, you see uh, a text which congratulates uh, Bentick on his various achievements, uh, uh, one including what they called abolishing cruel rights. So I tried to put uh, a sense of uh, the, the narrative of how Sati is represented in this statue uh, because it's, uh, uh, so we start at the, on the left and work our way around to the, uh, to the other side. Uh, I'm uh, curious to know what uh, local Calcuttans uh, make out of this or to what extent it is uh, an item of any interest or notice. Uh, but it, uh, I thought I, I would at least add it to the visual uh, imagery that we can work with. So let's look at the next one. And this is kind of series of representations of uh, sati uh, that I, I found from various uh, sources. This one is in the British Library collection, and it was uh, may have been the model for uh, the next one, uh, which was uh, uh, circulated in several uh, evangelical publications around the time of the run. And this one from James Pegg's uh, India's Cries to British Humanity. Um, and take a look at the on the far right of this picture, and you see two. Uh, male figures, uh, clearly uh, European or British, uh, looking, uh, walking away from the uh, sati that's taking place and covering their eyes uh, and uh, almost as though they're looking back through their fingers to, to gaze at what they most uh, don't want to see but can't take their eyes off of it. So uh, there's a kind of little detail that uh, it, uh, struck me when I first saw this. Uh, the next one is uh, similar, uh, but there's a, one slight difference. Uh, you see on this uh, case on the left is the uh, uh, presumably a, a missionary who is hanging his head in defeat, uh, being unable to uh, prevent this uh, from happening and drawing, uh, you might say, the um, sentiment of the viewer uh, toward the, the predicament of impotence in the face of what he took to be a, uh, an act of fundamental violation. Uh, the next one uh, is uh, a painting by Tilly Kettle. Uh, this was probably done in Madras. The, uh, the painting itself hangs in the uh, collection at the uh, 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 Oriental Club in London. Uh, and here you see uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, what could possibly be regarded as a kind of eroticizing of the uh, sati image and uh, with um, the ones, the figures on the left is of the Brahmins uh, who are uh, uh, 
sort of standing in astonishment, those who are bowing at, at her feet and the women uh, on the, mostly women uh, on, the, uh, on the right side. Uh, the next one is for, again, to put some, uh, uh, is uh, again, uh, I have somewhere here, I think, a, uh, this, this one by, oh, here we go. Um, this example is from uh, William Hodges. Uh, Hodges was well-known painter and draftsman. He served on Captain Cook's second expedition from 1772 to 74. So this is uh, before um, the period that we're focused on today, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, he, uh, he writes about this, uh, experience of that produced this painting. Uh, um, he said, well, I was pursuing my professional labels in Benar uh, labors in Benares. I received information of a ceremony which was to take place on the banks of the river, which greatly excited my curiosity. I had often read and repeated heard of the most horrid custom amongst perhaps the most mild and gentle of the human race, namely the Hindus the sacrifice of the wife and the death of the husband, and that by a means from which nature seemed to shrink in utmost abhorrence by burning. The person whom I saw was of the Vaisha or merchant tribe or caste, a class of people who we should naturally suppose exempt from the high and impetuous pride of rank, and in whom the natural desire to preserve life should in general predominate, undiverted from its proper course by a prospect of posthumous fame. Upon repairing to the spot on the side, on the banks of the river where the ceremony was to take place, I found the body of the man on a bier and covered with linen, already brought down and laid at the edge of the river. At this time, about 10 in the morning, only a few people were assembled who appeared destitute of feeling at the catastrophe that was to take place. I may even say that they displayed the most perfect apathy and indifference. After waiting a considerable time for the, the wife appeared, attended by Brahmins and music with some few relations. The procession was slow and solemn the victim moved with steady and firm step, apparently with a perfect composure and countenance. Approach the body, I'm sorry, approach close to the body of her husband where some time they halted, where for, for some time they halted. She then addressed those who were near her with composure and without the least trepidation of voice or change of countenance. She held in her hand, her left hand, a coconut, which was, uh, which was a red color mixed up and dipping in, in it the forefinger of her right hand, she marked those near her to whom she wished to show the last act of attention. As, as at this time I stood close to her, she observed me attentively and with the color marked me on the forehead. She might have been about 24 or, 20, or 25 years of age, a time of life when the bloom of beauty had generally fled the cheek in India, but still she preserved a sufficient share to prove that she might have been uh, a handsome, might have been handsome. Her figure was small, but elegantly turned. The form of her hands and arms were particularly, sorry, particularly beautiful. Her dress was a loose robe of white flowing drapery and the extended and that extended from her head to her feet. The place of sacrifice was higher up on the bank of the river, a uh, uh, hundred yards or more from the spot where we now stood. And when the body was taken up, she followed close to it, attended by the chief Brahmin. And when it was deposited on the pile, she bowed to all around her and entered without speaking. The moment she entered, the door was closed. The fire was put to combustibles, which instantly flamed and immense quantities of dry wood and other matters were thrown upon it. 
This last part of the ceremony was accompanied with the shouts of the multitude who now became numerous and the whole seemed a mass of confusing rejoicing. For my part, I felt myself actuated by very different sentiments. The event that I had been witness to as such that the minutest circumstances attending it could not be erased from my memory. And when the melancholy which had overwhelmed me was somewhat abated, I made a drawing of the subject from a picture since painted, uh, the annexed plate was engraved. There is apparently a painting uh, from which this uh, engraved, uh, in, engraved uh, in, in image was, uh, was taken. The painting is apparently is no longer, um, we don't know where it is, it's not. Um, let me just say one little comment about Hodges. Hodges' uh, visual representation of what he witnessed draws on classical traditions of Western art, presenting the figures in stately possession in a tableau or a free, as though, uh, or like a frieze in a Greek temple. The wife seems self possessed and dignified, as do the priests and others behind her. He chooses to depict the solemn moment before she enters the pyre rather than of the immolation itself, as we saw in the, uh, more in the missionary uh, images. Despite Hodge's testimony of the melancholy which overwhelmed him, he preserved and he persevered in giving both written and visual account of his experience. He notes that he did not share the mood of the crowd with its, quote, mass of confused rejoicing, unquote, but neither does he take the opportunity uh, to uh, uh, take the high moral ground or to announce his cultural superiority, a response that would become more common in the decades after Hodge's encounter with Sati. Um, so the uh, next image, uh, let's see, uh, this was from the late 18th century. Uh, and what you see here is uh, the, that uh, she is uh, joining her husband. And over here uh, are what may be uh, British uh, military uh, figures uh, who are keeping a distance from, they are not engaging in, uh, in, in any way uh, with this uh, event that's being depicted. Uh, let's see, I think there's, yeah, now I want to show you a couple of uh, uh, more. Uh, the next one, uh, which I just came across recently, uh, this one is in the uh, Welcome Institute collection. Uh, and here we see the, uh, the figure, uh, the, uh, the act of, of immolation is taking place. Uh, but the sati herself is is looking uh, doesn't seem to be touched by the fire. She's looking uh, straight out at at the viewer, uh, and the uh, the next one is actually I think a, a, a artistically a, a more complete uh, and better image. This is in the British Library collection, and here again uh, we see this sort of uh, we see the the sacred river. Uh, so we're actually as viewers, we're actually standing in the rivers, you might say, uh, looking on the riverbank as this uh, sati is taking place. In this image, we've got a, several uh, sepoy, uh, red-coated soldiers, uh, some kind of uh, activity going on here. I'm not sure uh, what what is what that is. I've, uh, I've tried to find out with my Vedic colleagues whether there's a, some ritual that that we're is taking place, uh, possibly a pilgrimage uh, group of, of figures here heading perhaps uh, to temples up on the on the hillside. Um, okay, we'll go one more. No, this uh, for those of us who have not been there and don't live in Kolkata, uh, this is Ramo Hanroy's house. Uh, which has been uh, masterfully turned into a museum. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to visiting that when when I can, 
when, when the virus will abate and we'll all be able to travel again. Uh, and then I'll just take one more for now. Um, and uh, these are, this is my collection of uh, some of the uh, major figures I think that uh, this, uh, the Sati discourse would need to include. Uh, we have, of course, Ram Mohan in the center. Uh, this is a, a painting of him, I think, before he went to Britain. Uh, and then we have uh, Colebrook, who wrote the first kind of uh, textual uh, uh, essay on Sati. Uh, and then um, here we have um, uh, William Carey and his uh, pundit, uh, perhaps Mertunjaya. Uh, uh, here we have Ward, William Ward, baptizing uh, in the in the uh, Hooghly River, uh, Bentic, of course. This is H.H. Uh, uh, Wilson. Uh, over here we have Radha Kondeb, and down here uh, De Rosio and Charles Grant, uh, who's uh, uh, wrote a, a, a very important book uh, on. Uh, It's been uh, it's been republished. Uh, it is the uh, observations on the state of society among the Asiatic subjects of Great Britain, uh, and and Grant is, was a Scotsman uh, and had uh, uh, constructed a uh, image of uh, Indians, especially uh, Bengalis, because he was based in in Calcutta for much of his career in India. Then he uh, ultimately became a chairman of the board of the East India Company. But his construction of, in, of Indians and Hindus specifically was to use his word, uh, they were depraved. Uh, and so it's, uh, depravity can be both uh, economic uh, as uh, impoverishment, or it can be a moral category. Uh, and I think for, for Grant, both of those would have applied to his construction of of, of Indians, uh, which is a very negative one. And uh, this is taking place around the time that the, uh, the Orientalist vision uh, was uh, with uh, William Jones and others, including Wilson certainly, uh, was uh, cr creating a much more, more positive uh, uh, notion of, of, at least of ancient Indian culture. Uh, uh, and then we have, uh, this is uh, one that may not be familiar to us, and that's Thomas Buxton, who was a member of uh, the House of Commons. Uh, he was a very close associate of this fellow, uh, uh, William Wilberforce, uh, who uh, had worked together in the, uh, in the uh, 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 movement to abolish the slave trade uh, and were uh, lifelong evangelicals. Uh, and Buxton is, uh, was the one who uh, had the uh, House of Commons release uh, what we think of now called the parliamentary papers. That is the, the reports and documentation uh, of uh, uh, the years from about what, 1818 to 1829 uh, of uh, the, uh, the uh, suttis that were taking place uh, in uh, in the districts that the British had some kind of uh, supervision of. I wanna just take one, take the next one and then we'll, we, uh, and this is a page out of their reports. Uh, and what, uh, what I think is, is striking about this, these parliamentary papers is, is the emergence of quantitative knowledge. Uh, where uh, up until th they started making lists and documenting the suttis that they had uh, sent out, the, excuse me, they had heard about or gotten wind of and sent to either went themselves, the uh, magistrates went themselves or sent uh, some of their Indian employees to, uh, uh, to get information about uh, the place, the cast, uh, the circumstances around uh, each of these sati events, and and this all then became available in Britain uh, to uh, uh, and was used quite extensively by uh, critics of uh, sati and by advocates who were opponents of sati, who were also advocates of uh, uh, abolition uh, of it. Um, 
so that's the visual part. <laughs> um, in between 18, around 1815, you all would know better than you would think of when this uh, started, but uh, we have by the 1820s uh, and up until the abolition of uh, 1829, a series of, of pamphlet wars between Ramohan and uh, his opponents, uh, the central figure being uh, Radha Kandeb, and a close work at uh, the first of Ramohan's uh, pamphlets on sati, uh, a response to a, if I'm getting this right, uh, a re you know, well, yeah, um, uh, response to Mertundia, Mertundia, uh, Vidya Lankar, that uh, whether sati was a dharmic act, but an inferior one, or to uh, a, a dharmic widowhood. The sati provides some benefit for the short run. Devotion can lead the way uh, to moksha or fruition. What is adharmic is for sati to be forced, uh, for a sati to be forced into it. And what is adharmic is the widows are violated by predators uh, within the family and community. So the uh, the first text that, uh, um, well, the only, really the only of the, of, uh, of Ramah, I mean, of uh, yeah, Ramahan's text um, is in, the title is Translation of a Conference Between an Advocate for and an Opponent of the Practice of Burning Widows Alive. Uh, it, it came out in 1818. It, it was uh, widely circulated. Uh, and uh, it, an idea of the arguments it contains might tend to alter. No, this is uh, a quote from Ramahan. Uh, why he had released this uh, publication. He said, an idea of the arguments it contains might tend to alter notions that some European gentlemen entertain on this subject. It has induced the writer to lay before the British public also in its present dress. Uh, so it was written in both uh, Bengali and English uh, and uh, had an anonymous authorship. It's the uh, uh, Mimamsa style of debate. Uh, an advocate for uh, sati is an advocacy for the trustworthiness of tradition, protecting the opportunity for wives who seek to remain with their husbands in joint immolation. Or with, um, on, uh, on nation, uh, uh, versus an opponent for whom sati is actually suicide, which is forbidden in the Shastras, and quote, by every race of men, unquote. Uh, in other words, it is both specific to Hindu and universal. That, that is, suicide is both, has its specific Hindu form, but it's also a universal, uh, held in uh, critical, uh, critically universal. Uh, so for the advocate, the, really, the sati is, is false. Um, and uh, no, I'm sorry, the advocate uh, takes the position that the opponent's view is false. And it is not forbidden in the Shastras. And there is a long string of quotations from various Shastras, Puranas, and Nibandas uh, that are uh, sort of listed one after the other. The opponent then takes the view, yes, there are quotations in the Shastras, but they are of inferior authority. And the desire for life in heaven, using this Ramahan's words, heaven is not a full release, and therefore it is inferior uh, to moksha. He cites the authority of Manu that the wife should remain in the world, living an ascetic life and remaining connected to her husband by devotion regarding him as having the form of a deity. So bhakti then is, does bhakti then become the model uh, for the widow? All other Shastras are inferior and don't, that don't agree with Manu. Uh, and uh, Manu actually makes no reference uh, whatsoever to Sati. Uh, so what are we to make of Manu's silence on Sahagamana as an alternative of equal or greater value? Perhaps sati practice was not part of Manu's culture, and no question had arisen about whether self-immolation fit within the framework of dharma, 
uh, for wives facing uh, the cremation of their husbands. Perhaps Manu did not consider sati a viable dharmic category, not worth mentioning. Ramahan ap apparently interpreted Manu's silence as an assent to the principle that Sahagamna was adharmic, that Manu's authority was grounded in the Vedas. So now I would like to uh, turn to another arena uh, in which the model of advocate uh, and opponent were at work in Calcutta and Britain in the 1820s and culminating in Bentick's decision to place Sati under the category of the criminal. And here I'm gonna just uh, kind of walk through a little bit of uh, Bentick's minute on Sati, which I think is an important colonial text uh, in its own right uh, that uh, uh, is worth a, a sort of careful reading. Uh, uh, Bentick frames his uh, rather lengthy minute uh, with the question, with the following statement. He says, whether the question to continue or discontinue the practice of sati, the decision is equally surrounded by an awful responsibility. This is almost as though Bentick were, in, were channeling uh, Hamlet's uh, uh, to be or not to be a uh, question. From Bentick's position as governor general, the decision was inescapable. <laughs> the consideration of Sati had been going on for nearly three decades and the time to do something about it was arriving. Uh, Bentick saw his options. One, he could do nothing, uh, re continue to regard it as a religious matter uh, and year after year, hundreds of innocent victims to a cruel and untimely end. What has changed, uh, what has changed is Britain now has the power to prevent it. No conscience can contemplate without horror, he says. And a second option would be uh, based on the received opinions uh, to be considered of any value to put hazard to a contrary course, the very safety of the British Empire in India, and to extinguish once and for all hope for those great improvements affecting the condition of not hundreds and thousands, but of millions, which can be expected from the continuance of our supremacy. Is an alternative, he says, which in the light of humanity itself may be considered as still a greater evil. In other words, if the prohibition of sati becomes the policy, it gives rise to, it could give rise to an overwhelming rebellion. Uh, all good things the British can bring to India would be lost. Britain lost the American colonies within living memory and they were not about to lose another one. Aware of the novelty of the situation, Bentick says the sanction of countless ages the example of previous Muslim regimes, the universal veneration of people seem authoritatively to forbid both to feeling and to reason any interference in the exercise of their natural prerogative. In venturing to be first to deviate from this practice, Bentick was very aware that uh, uh, he was charting, new uh, charting a new direction. Uh, it, becomes me, it becomes me to show that nothing had been yielded to feeling, but that reason and to reason alone has governed the decision. Reason here is defined as opposed to feeling. Bentick rests in the confidence that reason is a universal good, where feeling is local and non-universalizable. Now, Bentick had done his homework, he had access to the database that was updated each year as the reports uh, came in from, the, uh, com uh, from company sources. Uh, there was a steady quantitative knowledge production based not so much on anecdotal report, but on lists, classifications, locations, and interference. Had, uh, and uh, Bentick was somewhat haunted by uh, the notion that it, uh, interference in sati may have uh, ironically uh, done more harm than good. In other words, it had encouraged um, the practice rather than uh, con constraining it. Um, canvassing the military leadership 
uh, about whether the uprising, whether uprising would result, Bentic want, uh, wanted uh, that advice. The majority for total ab uh, abolition uh, was for total abolition. Uh, some for gradual weaning away from the practice. Uh, Bentic was also aware that nothing short of complete prohibition, in other words, making sati go away, would be acceptable to the British public uh, back home. Uh, Ramahan Roy was consulted uh, and he wrote, uh, Bentic wrote, uh, he says, I must acknowledge that a similar opinion as to the probable excitation of a deep distrust of our future intentions was mentioned to me in conversation by that enlightened native Ram Mohan Roy, a warm advocate for the abolition of satis and all other superstitions and corruptions engrafted on the Hindu religion, which he considers originally to have been a pure deism. It was his opinion, um, this is Bentik now describing Ramahan, it was his opinion that the practice might be suppressed quietly and unobservedly by increasing the difficulties by which the indirect agency of the police. He apprehended that any public enactment would give rise to general apprehension that the reason uh, with the reason being that the English were when the English were contending for power they deemed it politic to allow universal toleration and to respect our religion but having obtained supremacy their first act was a violation of that profession and the next will probably be like the Mohammedan conquerors to force upon us their own religion. Um, let me turn now to uh, the Orthodox party's uh, uh, petition uh, to Bentic. And, and here we get some insight into what they felt was uh, at stake for them. About four weeks after Bentic released his minute on Sati, he received a petition from a number of prominent native gentlemen, including Radhakant Deb and Bahani Charan Bandopajai. Uh, Bentic received them in the council chamber of government house. Certain position, certain persons taking upon them, and here's the, uh, their petition, and uh, presumably this is a reference to uh, Ram Mohan. Uh, the petition says, quote, certain persons taking upon themselves to represent the opinions and feelings of the Hindu inhabitants of Calcutta. These opinions and feelings, the petition asserted, have been misrepresented and that Bentik is about to put a stop to the practice of performing satis and interference with the religion and custom of the Hindus which we most earnestly deprecate and cannot view without serious alarm. So in other words, their, their position is that Ramahan's claims to represent Hindus is false and the uh, Orthodox party should be understood to speak for all Hindus. And they continue, the text continues from time immemorial and here Hinduism is standing outside of historical time. So from time immemorial, the Hindu religion is founded like all religions on usage and precept, each sacred to the other. From the uh, sanction of immemorial practice, widows prefer of their own accord and pleasure and for the benefit of their husband's souls and for their own, the sacrifice of self-immolation which is not merely a sacred, and it's uh, emphasized in the original text, the sacred duty, but a high privilege of her who sincerely believes in the doctrines of their religion. And that any interference, not only an unjust tolerant and tolerant dict uh, dictation of matters of conscience, but is likely wholly to fail in procuring the end proposed. In other words, uh, even if uh, Bentic does abolish sati, it won't, it won't work. It will, sati will continue to take place despite uh, uh, colonial authority. The position was putting on the table the cat a category, the wife who exercises her own agency to end her life together with her husband. 
She does this to benefit both her husband and herself and their extended families. The previous Muslim regimes never attempted to prohibit sati, and neither had any of Bentik's predecessors as governors general. Indeed, it had been East India Company policy to regard native religion as a, what I call a protected category. All the parties to the debate over sati, whether Orthodox or reformers or British uh, administrators or missionaries, all agreed that sati was religious. Whether it was false religion or inferior religion or a rare and transcendent moment as the Orthodox regarded it was the question. The notion that sati is not a requirement of authoritative texts, a perspective or doctrine derived from a number of Hindus who, had, uh, who have apostatized from the religion of their forefathers and who have defiled themselves, and here they're presumably describing uh, Ramon, who def defiled themselves by eating and drinking things in the society of Europeans are endeavoring to deceive your leadership, your sorry, your lordship. So this is the, the voice of the Orthodox party to uh, Bentik, uh, trying to construct Ramahan as a, uh, uh, rep uh, articulating uh, deceptions as to what Hinduism really was uh, um, claiming and not claiming. And uh, it continues uh, challenging um, Ramahan's authority uh, he's, they, the text, uh, the petition continues, none but pundits and Brahmins and teachers of holy lives and known learning and authority ought to be consulted. Ramahan had no standing because he violated commensality practices appropriate to Brahmins. And he is not, quote, we might say nowadays, he's not professionally trained, unquote. If the state seeks to put itself in the position of deciding what it that is what Hindus ought to believe and what they ought to reject as is a tax, a tech, sorry, is a task that should be reviewed by those whose knowledge of the tradition was well grounded with full respect for that tradition. Anything short of that, um, the petition argued, will be regarded with horror and dismay throughout the company's dominions as a signal of a universal attack on all that we revere. Now, during Cornwallis administration, Christian missionaries, uh, they allege, secretly conveyed to the council some false and exaggerated accounts of the sati practice adva and advanced that it was not lawful. The question of Hindu women being thrown into the fire was for them fake news. On the concurrent report, of various gentlemen then in the civil service and in all instances which come under their cognizance, the widows went to the funeral piles of their, heir, uh, uh, of their deceased husband tearfully and these governors general were satisfied and no further interference was attempted. So how to explain this upsurge in satis? The courts could not account for it. Quote, even though it might perhaps have occurred to gentlemen of so much experience that the interference of government, even to this extent with the practice was likely by drawing to it the attention to the native community of a greater degree than formally to increase the number of votaries. In other words, if I'm understanding this, that uh, What was what what they were trying to suggest is that the representation of uh, these uh, satis as uh, f forms of um, um, public murder were in fact uh, false information uh, that was uh, reaching the uh, authorities, the British authorities, and that to uh, assume that those were were accurate or correct would be a mistake. In other words, the rise of sati incidents was partly the consequence of government surveillance. The implication being, uh, the implication that benign neglect would be a better policy and the less said about sati in the public square, the better. The, the predecessor, that is Bentic's predecessors had, according uh, to this 
uh, orthodox position had never come to a resolution by which devout and conscientious Hindus must be um, must be placed in the most painful of all predicaments uh, and either forego in some degree their loyalty to government and disobey its, or disobey its injunctions and violate the precepts of their religion. In other words, this put uh, a serious Hindu into a double bind situation to pursue uh, uh, sati would be to remain an advocate for the practice and uh, would also be uh, to engage in illegal activity. So there was, it's a kind of no win situation uh, either way they go. The Orthodox petitioners, and I've seen this uh, petition, the original of the petition, it's, it's in the University of Nottingham Library, and it's a very long scroll uh, written uh, with exquisite uh, calligraphic penmanship and uh, some 800 signatures, the, a handful of them in English and the rest in, in Bengali or in Devanagari. Um, The, uh, the Orthodox position placed high value on traditional practice and the authority of religious experts and the dangers to the state of attempting to micromanage the concremation in affirmation of the wife's authentic devotion and in full possession of her agency. The petition largely ignored the question that was foremost in Bentick's and increasingly in the company's mind, namely uh, women being forced, tied down and that any claim of it being religious was itself a deception to those inside or outside the Hindu community. Now, um, I want to turn now to um, uh, having a sketched out a little bit, at least a Bentix position uh, uh, and the uh, orthodox response, uh, the concerns and anxieties that, uh, that their text re uh, re uh, reveals. Uh, one of the people that Bentick turned to for uh, uh, interpretation and uh, uh, advice about how to proceed on the, on the sati matter was the Orientalist uh, uh, Horace Heyman Wilson. And I want to uh, look again carefully at his response to Bentick. It's a, it was a long letter uh, in which uh, we, we have a construction of, of Hinduism by uh, a British scholar of um, uh, of Indian culture and uh, 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 very much active in uh, the, the uh, in the uh, uh, support of Hindu college and other emerging educational institutions. Uh, he was uh, a close uh, um, colleague of uh, uh, several of the people who would also be uh, would identify themselves with the orthodox position that that I've sort of tried to summarize here. At the time the sati controversy found its way to the desk of the governor general in council, Wilson was universally regarded as the leading scholar of Sanskrit literature. He had arrived in Calcutta in 1809, assigned to the Calcutta Mint, and under the mentoring of Henry Colebrook, Wilson took to the study of Sanskrit and published a number of translations, a book of, on Sanskrit drama, a Sanskrit English dictionary, and other scholarly books and articles. In addition, he became involved in a number of educational projects, including this Calcutta School Book Society, uh, published a, uh, a publishing venture that made inexpensive books in Indian languages available for students, uh, Hindu college where the traditional Indian and Western subjects were taught, and an important advisory committee to the governor general looking into the state of education in Bengal. The wilson Bentick exchange takes us into the worlds of two men coming from very different perspectives. Wilson was the seasoned India hand who had been in Calcutta continuously for nearly 20 years and was the most connected of any European with the leaders of the elite Calcutta Hindu community. He knew all of them. Uh, the advocates and the opponents. He was a man of sober and quiet temperament. He had a, was a leading figure among the so-called Orientalist camp in the India lobby and vigorously supported institutions and initiatives that brought Indians and Europeans together as colleagues in the study of India's literary, philosophical and religious traditions. 
Wilson must have known that Bentick was already, had already made up his mind about the Sati uh, question. Bentick's association with the evangelicals in London was hardly a secret. There was a tone to Wilson's letter suggesting he knew he would have little or no success in persuading Bentick of the potential long range costs of state interference. Wilson's letter is remarkable in its avoidance of the more sensational aspects of the Sati question, the suffering of women, the rapaciousness of priests, and the carnivalesque character of the Sati scenes that had become such stock feature in the press and pamphlet popular culture. A close reading of Wilson's letters to, letter to Bentick opens up for us a window into many of the issues involved. So on uh, November 25th of 1828, uh, uh, Bentick receives Wilson's letter. Uh, he goes straight to the point. Uh, he says, my opinions, I'm quoting him here. He says, my opinions are adverse to any authoritative interference in the practice. I am aware that this avowal may expose me to the imputation of absence of Christian charity or of common humanity, but I should be unworthy of the reference made to me by the governor general if I suffered to fear of undeserved detractions to re restrain the honest acknowledgement of sentiments that I entertain. In other words, Wilson is, is is advocating a non-interference, uh, knowing that he would be accused of uh, being uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, without compassion for the, for the predicament of the Satis. Wilson's adversity to the use of the power of the state to abolish Sati was grounded on two concerns. The first was that he was convinced that Sati fell within the category of religion, and that the East India Company had been consistent in claiming its neutrality in matters of religion. And secondly, he worried that abolition, while it was probably would not generate open revolt among Hindus, he said it, uh, it would, quote, alienate in a great degree the affections of the natives from their rulers and will seriously retard the progress of those loftier feeling and sounder notions, which are silently but permanently gaining ground upon the prejudices and practices of the Hindus. One of the arguments in favor of prohibiting sati used by the colonial administration was that sati did not have the sanction of authoritative Hindu religious sources. And therefore an intervention in the state would not be a violation of longstanding East India policy to not interfere in the religious practices of its subjects. Since as Mirtunjaya Vidyalankar uh, had pointed out, sati was not classified as obligatory. It did not therefore have the status of a command. Hence, sati shifted from the category of the religious to that of quote, custom, unquote. Moreover, the absence of any discussion of sati in the laws of Manu, generally regarded as the keystone and authoritative text by the British on Dharma, <coughs> gave silent support to the interpretation of sati that was later a degradation and abuse of an earlier tradition. Once sati could be severed from the category of religion, its abolition would not be a violation of their pol of British policy of non-interference. Wilson thought such an interpretation was an error and misleading. He was not impressed by the epistemic and taxonomic sleight of hand on the part of the British and worried that it would be interpreted by Hindu traditionalists as disingenuous and only deepened their anxiety about long-term British ambitions in India. Whatever authority Manu held, it was considerable, Wilson stressed. Other authorities, however, of equal sanctity are sufficiently explicit and the act is enumerated by them amongst the duties of the faithful widow, just as much as chastity is held to be the duty of the virtuous wife. The inducements to it are weighty and the residence in heaven is promised as its reward 
not only for the widow, but for her husband, who is thus elevated by her piety into paradise. This is Wilson's language here. And restored to her affections there for countless years. These promises and injunctions are set forth not by writers of recent date or dispense disputable authority, but by those whom the Hindus universally regard amongst the divine and inspired founders of their system. For, for the, from this, Wilson drew what for Bentick and his allies must have been an unwelcome conclusion. The textual sources Hindus regard as are authoritative and they have therefore the weight of commands as far as human weakness will admit their being obeyed and they cannot be directly opposed without violence to the conscientious belief of every order of Hindus. In the next paragraph, he pressed the point unequivocally. He writes, quote, the sati cannot be put down without interference with the Hindu religion, unquote. Whether sati could be abolished was for Wilson a separate question, one that he does not take up in his letter. Where he put the full weight of his authority was to remove any illusion on Bentick's part that he would not be breaking with the long tradition on the part of Hindu East India Company, sorry, of, on the part of the East India Company of non-interference in Hindu religious practices. At this point, the letter of Wilson shifts from analysis to advice. He said a safer and more manly mode of proceeding is to look at the matter fairly in the face than to endow to in, than to endeavor to persuade ourselves that we are not tampering with the Hindu faith. What we are do, uh, that we are doing nothing to shock the national creed and that we have in short no pledges of our own to violate and no opposition from the religious feelings of the natives of India to counter. Having said that, Wilson reassures Bentick that the prohibition would not likely lead to open revolt, the anxiety that uh, led to much of Bentick's uh, reflections on what to do. He anticipated rightly that petitions against the prohibition would follow as they did, and he was not confident that the prohibition was even enforceable. Quote, the people will not regard the prohibition and satis will be attempted in spite of the law, unquote. Satis will be attempted, he argued, not without notice to the police and the police or the police will be bribed. Indeed for Wilson, if the state were serious about the prohibition, it needed to consider carefully how it would be implemented. On this Wilson wrote, quote, the government must be prepared to let the prohibition remain inoperative or to enforce it by means which will partake very much of the nature of religious persecution. The consequence from the Hindu perspective, Wilson argued, would quote, diffuse a very extensive dread and detestation of the British authority. In what is probably an oblique reference to Ramahan Roy, uh, Roy's argument that Sati did not fall within the construction of an authentic Hinduism, Wilson countered, quote, even if I may be mistaken in regarding the abolition of Satis as actual interference with the Hindu religion, I think it will be scarcely be denied that it would, that it will be so considered by the Hindus themselves. One or two individuals in Calcutta who have signaled themselves by dissenting from many of the practices and principles of the religion, here I think he's referring to Ramon, may hold a different persuasion, but the vast body of the population will concur in the same impression, namely that the government has to legislate not for a handful of sectaries, but for Hindus at large. Wilson's attempt to convey to Bentick the fragility of confidence that the Hindus uh, he worked with had in the British regime on matters of religion. The combination of reformers from within, that is the handful of sectaries, 
uh, and what Wilson called the indiscreet zeal of English missionaries had eroded their sense of, comp of the company's neutrality. For Wilson, it was essential to keep their trust if there were to be any chance of, quote, any arrangements intended for their improvement would be successful. If on the other hand, they quote, once they once, once they suspect an ulterior, uh, ulterior object, such as that of the subversion of their faith, they are likely to relapse into sullen distrust and reluctant acceptance of any offered amelioration. Wilson, held, Wilson was held in high opinion by Hindus. They are, he wrote, quote, an intelligent and inquisitive people willing to receive information and not averse to controversy. When, however, they find themselves on the defensive, he continued, their obstinate adherence to their own opinions is proportioned to what they think an unfair method of refuting them. So Wilson's advice to Bentick then basically was to do nothing. The state should stay out of the matter altogether. If matters be left to their present footing, I hope many years will not elapse before important improvement will be effected. The move to criminalize sati, Wilson argued, would be a regressive one. It would result in what Wilson terms a deterioration of the national character, unquote. A departure on the part of the British from their often reiterated policy of religious toleration and neutrality would be contradicted by their practice of interference in what was widely regarded by the Hindus themselves as a religious event. The lesson for Hindus, Wilson asserted, would be for them to, quote, question the inviolability of British faith, end quote. Wilson turned to the issue of the policy currently pursue, sorry, pursued, whereby district magistrates were obliged to monitor satis to determine whether they were conducted within the guidelines of Hindu practice, namely that the wife was not coerced and that any young children were adequately cared for. In retrospect, Wilson thought it might have been better for the British authorities to have never gotten involved in the first place. One of the intended consequences of surveillance of Satis after 1814, he thought, had, was that it probably rather intended to render the practice more extensive. Wilson was not alone in this view. It is a theme that turns up frequently in the official records. There was a spike in the reports of incidents of Satis in 1817 and 18. Wilson attributed it to the se severe cholera epidemic and other and more extensive reporting by the magistrates. In other words, more and better data. He speculates that there may have been some increase in Satis when Hindus may have suspected that, quote, an indigenous, sorry, an injudicious interposition on the part of the magistrates. Nevertheless, Wilson does acknowledge that colonial interference probably did prevent many illegal satis and prevent abuses. In weighing the cost of doing nothing or interfering with satis, Wilson takes the view that more harm may be done in attempting to do good. I should not think it advisable to countenance the interference of authorities. In many cases, it has been attended with circumstances of great inhumanity, as well as the loss of life it was intended to prevent. It creates great dissatisfaction and jealousy among the bulk of people. And in every case where it is unsuccessfully exerted, adds to the reputation of the victim and multiplies the number of those who are thus misled to imitate so honorable an example. That's a quote from Wilson. Wilson concludes his letter by modestly calling attention to his own scholarly and social authority. Quote, he says, I have read much and perhaps most of what has been published on the subject and both in Bengal and in Benares have had frequent communications with intelligent Hindus related to it. I have found no difference of opinion among them. 
even though he was confident, he was accurately reporting the perspectives of the texts and the great majority of elite Hindu opinion, he notes that his views, quote, may possibly be erroneous. And I should rejoice to find them so. At least I have not formed them precipitously. In other words, um, Wilson is uh, saying that the, uh, uh, it would be a mistake not to take seriously the claim that sati is religious and therefore uh, has to be uh, protected by the state, or uh, he thinks he's right about that, but uh, he would rejoice, he says, to find that he was wrong. In the final uh, sentence, he notes in a similar mood, it is from these sources that my conclusions have been drawn. And I have only to regret that they are in opposition to my feelings. So Wilson's perspective on Sati was complex, nuanced, and perhaps naive. His silence on the specter of women being sacrificed under dubious circumstances leaves him with perhaps an idealistic interpretation or representation of Sati. He had no doubt but that the practice did indeed have the authority of multiple texts in the Dharma traditions, and that satis were revered across a wide spectrum of Hindu society. He finally did not endorse the practice, but he was convinced that interference of colonial authorities was counterproductive and contributed to an increase in the practice. For Wilson, the colonial interference, however humanely intended, became the cure that was worse than the disease. He had modest confidence in the gradual change among Hindu elites that would lead to an abandonment of the practice. And he would have, it would have to be the Hindus themselves who pressed for the abandonment of sati, and that would take time. This change would need to be nurtured carefully by the colonial state by reassuring Hindus of its commitment to non-interference in matters of religion. Under the present policy of surveillance and interference, some excesses may have been contained, but the larger and more amorphous process of Hindu suspicion of British intentions only served to push them into an increasingly defensive posture and a less critical embracing of their own most inhumane aspects in their own tradition. Wilson thought that the strident language of evangelical missionaries and Ram Mohan Roy and his colleagues radical rejection of much of Hindu practice only polarized the community and made the prospect of genuine reform from within more difficult. Uh, on the 8th of November of 1829, uh, Bentic responded uh, to Wilson, uh, and I'll, I'll just go over this quickly. Uh, over the next 10 months, uh, Bentic digested the comments of Wilson and others, and in his formal statement, uh, the, his minute on Sati, he begins with the understanding of what he termed the awful responsibility of the exercise of power. On the one hand, to content with the deaths of hundreds of women uh, when the power of the state can prevent it is a quote, a predicament which no conscience can contemplate without horror. On the other hand, Bentic reasoned to place security of the empire at risk and to quote, extinguish once and for all the hopes of great improvements can only be expected from the con continuance of our supremacy. May, uh, may be considered a still greater evil. In other words, uh, it, it would be an evil to uh, uh, continue to uh, uh, not prosecute satis uh, as criminal acts, but to regard them as religious acts is one form of evil, but to lose the empire altogether uh, would be a worse evil because even the, the Hindus would, would benefit from the uh, colonial arrangements. So there's a, there's a kind of implicit argument for the empire that is uh, taking place, it seems to me, and as I read this. Uh, Bentic resolved the dilemma on the side of his utilitarian principles. The highest consideration, he says, the good of mankind must prevail. Uh, he saw the duty of the state 
to be a force directed toward creating the conditions for human flourishing. Although respect for religion and the example of previous rulers, both Mughal and British, uh, counseled non-interference for Bentick, it was reason and reason alone, as he says, that guided his decision. The preamble to the Sati regulation on December 4th, 1829 stated, I guess maybe it's December 5th, I should say, uh, using our uh, uh, celebration of, the, of, the, of this, the passage of this law. Uh, anyway, stated the new policy in summary fashion. And it says, the quote, this practice of Sati of burning or burying alive the widows of Hindus is revolting to the feelings of human nature it is nowhere enjoined by the religion of the Hindus as an imperative duty. And on the contrary, a life of purity and retirement on the part of widows is more especially and preferably inculcated by a vast majority of that people throughout India, the practice has, that has not been kept up or observed. Uh, Bentley goes on at some length to sketch out the expansion of British power and the administrative infrastructure of the colonial state uh, that could make enforcement of the abolition of sati feasible in a way it would not have been even uh, recently as, his, as during his predecessor's administrations. Having polled his senior military uh, advisors, he was convinced that sati was continual, uh, if confined to relatively small areas, that there would be little uh, interest in or support for it among the Indian troops. He agreed with Wilson that the policy of partial interference has led to, quote, a sort of sanction of the ceremony, unquote. Hence, Bentick saw the choice as one of all or nothing. Given the increase in state power and his utilitarian perspective, to refuse to mobilize the state for the protection of his female subjects from harm would be a dereliction of duty. For Bentick, abolition represented the convergence of the state as moral agent and having political authority. When, he said, writes, when we have powerful neighbors, when we had powerful neighbors and great reasons to doubt our own security, expediency might have recommended an indirect or more cautious proceeding. But now we are supreme. My opinion is decidedly in favor of an open, avowed, and general proposition resting altogether on the moral goodness of the act, that is the act of abolition, and the power to enforce it. Having announced this uh, confident conclusion that abolition was right, expedient, and enforceable, he turns specifically to Wilson's letter. He says, on the, uh, of all the letters he received advising caution, there is none, Bentick wrote, to whom I am more disposed to pay greater deference than to Mr. Horace Wilson. Bentick appreciated Wilson's unique position as a Sanskrit scholar, the secretary of Hindu college, and the best acquainted with the Orthodox elite. He characterized Wilson as one who had, quote, more confidential intercourse with natives of all classes than any man in India, unquote. Bentick concedes Wilson's point that the practice of sati does fall within the category of religion and that most Hindus, quote, with few exceptions, regard it as sacred, unquote. He agreed with Wilson that the abolition would provoke dissatisfaction uh, but he was more confident than Wilson as to the success of abolition. With respect to Wilson's more subtle point that abolition will contribute to suspicion of the British intentions, that they will no longer be tractable to any arrangement intended for their improvement, Bentick notes that a similar point had been, had been made by, quote, the enlightened a native Ramahan Roy, a warm advocate for the abolition of satis. Here, Bentick was either misrepresenting Roy or did not understand his position. Ramahan did not favor indirect abolition, but only supported it after, I'm sorry, did not favor direct abolition, but only supported it after Bentick's minute was published 
And in the following sentence, however, Bentick does note, uh, does go on accurately to present Ramahan's view. He writes, it was his opinion, namely Ramahan's opinion, that the practice might be suppressed quietly and unobserved by increasing the difficulty and the indirect agency of the police. Well, let, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yes, Professor Cortright, I'm, so, I'm really so, terribly yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are about half an hour over time. So, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just, just, just to nudge you uh, to uh, sort of uh, wrap up or, 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 or just yeah. speak to us. Well, yeah, Be, yeah. So I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Oh, that's yes. okay. I, I got absorbed in this. Uh, that's sort of the. I think I've made enough points for us to uh, uh, proceed with a with a conversation. I think the the uh, maybe the takeaway for me at least in the Wilson uh, Benthic uh, uh, conversation was the way in which the balance between where what is the, what is the place and status of religion. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you've uh, muted yourself. Um, if you could just, yeah, just the last sentence. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. How that happened? Uh, it was. It was a. It was a uh, exchange about the authority of the state uh, and about what constitutes a, 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 the category of religion. That was. That's kind of what drew me into uh, looking into this. And uh, um, I'll. I, I'm sure the people in this in this group know much more about this than I do. So I'll, uh, I'm eager to hear what others have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I, I will now ask our discussant, uh, Dr. Ima Ramos, uh, to, to, to speak. I'll just give a very brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Ima Ramos has been the curator of the South Asia collection at the British Museum since 2015. Her research interests revolve around the relationship between religion, politics, and gender in South Asian visual culture. Her first book, Pilgrimage and Politics in Colonial Bengal, The Myth of the Goddess Sati, was published in 2017. Uh, and it examined an ancient network of pilgrimage sites dedicated to Sati, which provided the basis for an emergent territorial consciousness during the late 19th century. She is the curator of the recent exhibition, Tantra, Enlightenment to Revolution, 24th September 2020 to 24th January 2021, and the author of its accompanying book, which presents the first historical exploration of tantric visual culture from its origins in India to its reimagining in the West. So a very warm welcome to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramos. As you know, we're a little over time, uh, but uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks, Paul, for that uh, great paper. It's fascinating. Um, so I thought it was interesting that just a few years after Bentinck's uh, minute on Sati in 1835, um, that Macaulay outlined his infamous minute on education. Uh, which called for a mediating class, uh, English in opinions, morals, taste and intellect, but Indian in blood and colour, as he put it. Uh, so this debate happens just as the older Orientalist project was being replaced by the Anglicist liberal imperialism of, of Mill, with whom Bentinck uh, closely identified. Um, and as an art historian, I was really struck by the images that Paul showed us representing Sati as a symbol of female victimhood and male barbarism, which becomes a crucial symbol under which to legitimise imperial rule and the civilising mission. Uh, to justify and legitimise that mission, they promote this idea that they're saving Indian women from Indian men. But I found it interesting that this isn't explicitly rendered in the colonial images that we've seen. So you don't see the white man on the horse swooping in, um, but essentially that is what these images of pathos or suffering are trying to mobilize. They're trying to mobilize a certain affect, um, an affect that relates to the civilizing mission of the British. And uh, something interesting that happens in the late 19th century with very different kinds of renderings of Sati by Bengali artists and writers who foreground Indian manhood itself in relation to a sacrificial female figurehead 
And, um, and Paul and I thought it would be an idea to show some examples of these now very briefly. Um, I'll talk a, a little about them for the next few minutes and then after that um, I have a couple of questions for Paul uh, before we take in questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Uh, one second. Okay, so hopefully you can see these slides. So as we know, the ritual of widow immolation was named after the Hindu goddess Sati. Uh, and Sati as a goddess rose to sudden prominence from the late 19th century as a personification of the subcontinent and an icon of heroic self-sacrifice. So I'm going to show a few examples of images that circulated in Bengal at this time, which evoked Sati as an icon of cultural crisis and territorial consciousness. These were produced in the colonial capital of Calcutta in the form of watercolour paintings and lithographs. In the context of Paul's paper, it's interesting to reflect on the reasons why the subject was chosen for illustration during the British occupation and how these images visually articulated the rhetoric of sacrifice for the motherland. According to myth, Sati's father, King Daksha, did not invite her husband Shiva to his yajna. Humiliated by this act of disrespect, Sati performed self-immolation. The distraught Shiva retrieved her body and began to dance with it in his arms across the cosmos. His grief, his grief risked the destruction of the world, so Vishnu, the god of preservation, threw his discus and cut Sati's body into pieces which were scattered across the subcontinent. From around the 7th century onwards, texts start to refer to a network of shaktipitas, or seats of power, that enshrine each piece of the goddess. Modern imaginings of the myth often focus on the detailed classification of these body parts and which temple or location they correspond to, as in this uh, contemporary popular print. According to Hindu belief, the Shaktipitas were animated by Sati's divine presence. Through her dismemberment, the Shakti or power in her body was distributed across the subcontinent, stressing her relationship to the earth. In the late 19th century, Bengali writers, artists and intellectuals responded to the myth by reformulating and resurrecting her into a more powerful body. When a European school teacher told the Bengali writer Budev Mukhopadhyay that, quote, patriotism was unknown to Hindus, Budev would later note that the Sati myth showed that, quote, the entire motherland with its 52 places of pilgrimage is in truth the person of the deity. The dismemberment of Sati was further politicized when the revolutionary philosophies of the Swadeshi movement made their presence felt during the 1905 partition of Bengal. This fragmentation of territory led to even greater need for a unified social body. Aurobindo Ghosh, one of the leaders of the movement, published a rousing 1908 article for the English language newspaper Bandamataram entitled The Parable of Sati. In it, he reinterpreted the story in terms of the contemporary political struggle in India, with Sati representing the Indian nation and Shiva India's destiny. For now, their union had been frustrated, and I'll just read out a few sentences from this quote. He says, Sati had left her old body, and men said she was dead, but she was not dead, only withdrawn from the eyes of men. For Sati will be born again, in a better and more beautiful body, Sati shall wed Mahadeva, that the national life of India shall meet and possess its divine and mighty destiny. So here Sati becomes a symbol for national regeneration. In this vein, Nandalal Bose's watercolour painting of Sati was quickly celebrated as an icon of heroic self-sacrifice two years after the partition of Bengal in 1907. The painting represents the moment of her immolation and the focus is on the apparent mystical nature of this sacrifice through the rendering of fire as a shimmering haze enveloping the peaceful figure. 
The figure of Sati was also, of course, directly associated with the practice of widow immolation. Sati as a Hindu practice was re-envisioned by some as an act of resistance against colonial attempts to initiate reform. Anti-imperialists paralleled the sacrifice for one's country with the widow's immolation. We see this with uh, this print that you can see produced by the Calcutta Art Studio. This scene was printed in 1883, the same year as the Sati print produced by the same studio that we saw a bit earlier. In the centre, the fictional heroic Rajput princess Sarojini is shown about to mount a funeral pyre, refusing to enter the harem of the conquering Sultan of Delhi, shown on the left. Sarojini was a character invoked in tales of Queen Padmini of Chittor. According to legends, Padmini committed Sati in 1303 after her husband was defeated by the Sultan's army. And this tale of bravery became a veiled metaphor for anti-imperialist defiance by the time this print was made. The Bengali literati's romanticised retellings of Rajput displays of valour served to inspire patriotic spirit. Admini and Sarojini became symbolic of the motherland, inviting others to rise up and protect its honour. The ritual of Sati was often fetishised in both colonial and anti-imperialist rhetoric, in which the widow martyr was projected as an idealised fantasy, sometimes with erotic undertones, representing the obedient and pure Hindu woman. Such a woman was deemed to require authoritative protection, whether by colonial authorities or anti-imperialists. This fight over the body of the Indian woman assumed a territorial dimension as both sides fought over the gendered body of the subcontinent. A pilgrimage souvenir depicting Shiva carrying the body of Sati functioned as a metaphor for the need to protect and fight for Mother India during the colonial period. This is visually articulated by invoking pathos, mourning and sacrifice. Across these images, she's idealised and immaculate. In the Kaligat paintings, her traditional Bengali sari and numerous ornaments are untarnished. Her long black hair cascades elegantly across Shiva's figure and her unblemished face often reveals a half smile. In the context of the colonial period and the re-envisioning of Sati as a nationalist icon, there is a strong suggestion that her martyred body appears not to suffer at all, but instead willingly sacrifices itself for the subcontinent. This reading of the souvenir images was of course not part of the original myth, which described her sacrifice as one she performed for her husband. However, by the 19th century, writers such as Aurobindo had taken inspiration from the narrative and lent it contemporary relevance by interpreting the distribution of her body across the country as a sacrifice for India. Across these images, Sati is consistently held up for display as a passive goddess for visual consumption, in contrast with the active figure of Shiva. As Spivak uh, has pointed out in her account of the myth, the transaction between great male gods fulfills the destruction of the female body and thus inscribes the earth as sacred geography. There is no space from which the sex subaltern can speak. During the late 19th century, the mother as Sati, however, was no mere victim, but also an embodiment of strength and sacrifice an icon of patriotism and an ethical ideal to be imitated rather than merely an object to be saved. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen now and um, swiftly move on to ask um, Paul uh, a question or two and I know that we're really short on time so I, I think it would be great to open up um, to the audience uh, as soon as possible, but but I'm just very uh, I'm very keen to ask him uh, a question or two. Uh, and my first one is, how did Sati stop being classified as uh, religious, Paul? Uh, so, what notion of religion was was driving the debates, these exchanges and debates at the time? Um, yeah, 
a quick response. I think the, there are certain notions of religion that the British themselves had for reasons having to do with their with its history, but uh, the notion that uh, of some kind of obligation, some kind of command, or uh, um, authorized behavior uh, would would be protected, uh, as it were, a protected category with, as religious. Um, that, of course, is what's contested uh, by Ramahan and and and, uh, and others, namely that uh, it becomes um, deconstructed as religious, you might say, and moves and shifts into the category of the criminal. Uh, and so then it, it, it now becomes, uh, a, you know, a, a challenge for the legal system to uh, protect women from this um, his, from this practice, which is alleged to be religious, but we've now uh, exposed it to be what it really is, which is uh, a murderous activity. So uh, that's the short answer that I give to that. Okay, that's uh, pretty interesting. Eager to hear, I'm eager to hear from others, so we can um, go ahead. Go. Yes, yeah, should we open up to, to yeah. questions from the audience? Um, do you have another question, Emma? You said you had a couple. Um, would you... Yes, but I'm. I mean, you know, perhaps we should open up, and then I, I could always ask if, if, uh, if there's time, I can always ask another question later. Sure. Um, yes, Professor Killingly. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, the question whether sati is a religious uh, act, of course, this uh, brings in. Uh, in a way, a foreign category of division between the religious and the secular. But uh, the answer was given in a way by uh, both Mutinja Vidyalanta, whom Paul mentioned, and by Ram Mohan, that uh, Sati, or Sahamaran to give it its proper title, uh, is an act which is kamya, that is to say, it uh, is directed towards satisfied desires because the, the sati is supposed to join her husband in heaven and enjoy bliss of various kinds uh, as an alternative to living as a widow. Uh, she is not a widow, uh, she only becomes a widow if she survives her husband, but if she dies with her husband, which is what Sahabara means, and uh, death is considered to include the cremation, the cremation is sort of uh, not something that happens after death, but culmination of a process of death. Uh, so if she joins her husband in that, she is doing something motivated by desire. And it is better to do something unmotivated and to live an ascetic life. Uh, Therefore, in a sense, uh, the, to survive her husband and not perform Sahamaran is a religious act, whereas Sahamaran is uh, an inferior act, although it is uh, for religious motives, but it's for religious motives which are based on desire and uh, the uh, uh, abandonment of desire is superior. Uh, so, from that point of view, uh, the answer, whether it's religious uh, or secular, is uh, the question is replaced by another question, whether it is religiously superior or religiously inferior, mm -hmm. and it is found to be inferior. And that, that's an important part of Ram Mohan's argument. Uh, but it's interesting that Ram Mohan, uh, at the end of his, his final uh, uh, dialogue uh, on Sati uh, leaves the question of Shastric uh, uh, law and uh, appeals to humanity on behalf of the Indian woman whom he represents as being uh, express, oppressed and exploited. Uh, and uh, he appeals not to Shastra but to humanity. Uh, and that, that's all part of the argument. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I can see uh, Professor Zastupil has his hand up. Uh, Lynn, do you want to go next? Uh, you're, you have to unmute you. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, a fascinating uh, presentation, uh, particularly um, I've been working on H.H. Wilson recently, so mm. I was particularly interested to hear uh, the long and uh, very uh, precise account of, of his views on that. Uh, first, I just want to start with a general comment. I don't know if you're aware, Paul, but uh, Jörg Fisch's book, uh, uh, he's a German, comes out of the German historical sociology tradition. I found his book, which the English translation has a terrible title, Immolating Women or Burning right. Women. Because <laughs> the German title is really following into death. Yeah. And that, that there is a, uh, there is, this was a fairly universal pattern in human history, uh, mostly uh, gone outside of uh, India. Uh, well, maybe Africa is an exception. But in any event, to, to kind of step aside from the question of religion or the particularities of Hindu religion, but look at it, look at it as a sociological phenomenon. Humans practice is kind of following into death. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, I found that very fascinating, but more specifically, uh, uh, I guess more of a comment than a, a, a question, and that is that the appeal as uh, the images we see, the appeals seem to be to British men, missionaries or men on horseback, but the missionaries actually appealed to British women. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were the main objects of their appeal. And Ramahun's uh, celebrity status that I, I talked about a few weeks, a few months ago, a lot of it had to do with his appeal to British women, uh, um, in part be, or large part because of his campaign against Sati. And that appeal uh, made him um, very much welcome when he was in Britain um, among feminists or women that would become feminists or, or that vanguard of feminism. Um, and so I, I think it find, I find it kind of interesting that the, the appeal is to British women and Ramahan's uh, right at the center of it. And we, and by the way, the missionaries spur British women to petition parliament before they petition on any other subject. Uh, before they petition on uh, ending slavery, they're petitioning parliament to abolish sati. They're getting involved in politics because of the sati campaign. Mm -hmm. And Ramhans, I think, at the thick of that. Anyway, uh, since time is short, I have a lot more I'd like to ask, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, if there's nobody else right at the moment, then I uh, had a question uh, that I'd sort of uh, like to ask. Uh, you're aware of, because you had the little um, portrait of De Rosio in your Gaelic mm. figures, um, <laughs> yes. uh, you are aware, of course, that, uh, that uh, De Rosio was somebody who in 1828 is actually advocating um, not banning uh, the practice. Uh, so this is in his notes to the Fakir of Janghira. Um, mm. And I wanted to um, draw that out into a larger question of agency, really. Because again and again, in a lot of the materials that I've looked at, this, uh, this uh, notion of agency is emphasized. The wife exercises her own agency. She is quite calm. She, she, it is her own decision. Her sons try, you, 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 you uh, described such a scene yourself. Uh, her sons or her family try to persuade her against what she's doing, but 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 she is um, uh, determined and she ascends the pyre. Uh, so the so the wedge that I'm trying to drive here is between the usual binary of the um, orthodox parties on the one side, Radha mm -hmm. and the reformers, the reforming party on the other side, Ramon Roy and the others. And somewhere in the middle, very interestingly, you have. Uh, a group that can only be described as, as you know, the first Indian moderns. So you have De Rosio and the students around De Rosio who are actually advocating agency in that they're saying that this is something that, uh, you know, the Hindus feel uh, 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 sort of have tender feelings uh, toward. It is a practice they have. And, and so they're not even going into the whole religion, not religion, mm -hmm 
custom religion. They're not going into all of that at all. Like Ram Mohan, who appealed to humanity, they too, in fact, appeal to um, the 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 figure of the human, but but not but in order to say in fact that the East India Company should not interfere with with the agency of Indians themselves to decide on these matters. So I was just wondering whether we could sort of reconfigure the picture a little bit to make space for this notion of agency, not just the woman's agency, which actually was a recorded fact in many of these uh, you know accounts. Uh, Hodges is, speaks of that uh, as well, yeah. um, but but to actually uh, try and um, think a little bit about uh, where the modern Indian stands in 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 relation, what is the politics of it in in you know, and and to take it away a little bit from the whole religion custom, uh, which which was the nineteenth century debate, of course, yeah. So. If you want to take all of that together, or we're we just piling questions onto you one after another. That's quite all right. It's very, it's very interesting. I think the, uh, uh, as I'm trying to uh, wrap my mind around the, might say the orthodox position, uh, that there, there may, uh, it may be uh, possible to uh, say that um, the, uh, the, the argument they were were making was. Uh, to protect the possibility of uh, a sati so inclined uh, to have space to fulfill that, that might be considered as agency. Uh, but it may also be kind of symbolic of some kind of notion of sovereignty. So in, in some ways, the, the orthodox position was, uh, was wanting the British to stay out of their their religious matters, or, or what uh, the, the, the whole question about whether the English word religion really has any kind of counterpart, uh, it's it's you know it's a translation for the word dharma, but dharma is such a rich and textured and nuanced category that uh, that uh, religion doesn't really capture. Uh, I think a lot of what's going on and in the whole debate over whether sati is dharmic or not. I mean that um, so. Uh, I like your your point about uh, carving a, a you know a sort of if not a middle space a, a space where those things are are or in tension or interacting with each other so so that there's a kind of dynamism that's churning what why won't this the sati issue go away why why do we, we Indians and non Indians for that matter I mean it's be, uh, whether it's a particularly South Asian phenomenon or whether it's a, a kind of universal phenomenon is. Uh, Lynn was suggesting um, that, uh, or Kermit was suggesting, I think is uh, an another way to, th to think about that. So that's very useful. And I, I'll go back. I, I have, uh, I have De Rosio, poet of India, here on my on my bookshelf. So I will uh, go back and look uh, look up that. I, I remember reading it some some time back, but I'll look at it again. Yes, because as you mentioned, the whole debate was with the miserable condition of widows. Basically, yeah. the argument was that we need to uh, uh, reform the conditions under which widowhood is imposed yes. upon Indian women. That's really the more important task at hand, um, rather than interfere with the rights of Indians uh, to do uh, as they please with regard to this particular right. Yeah. But um, yeah, are there any other questions? Would Brian, would you like to... Come in. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I, I wanted to um, comment in particular, ask a question that would put Paul's presentation in relation to Emma's comments, um, because I appreciate you you being here, Emma, to bring in the other side of the sati myth, as it were. But I'm I'm curious on the when the linkage first is made in the 19th century explicitly between sahamarana and then sati as the and the daksha sacrifice, because they're two different things, really, and the, the, the Sahamarana is not considered a, a sacrifice, as far as I understand, right? The woman is not, the, the discourse around her going willingly into the fire is not construed as sacrifice. But by, you know, with the Sarojini image you gave us, we have the kind of Jauhar model from Rajasthan of women avoiding capture and falling into the harem by sacrificing themselves in the fire. So I'm wondering when, when that first linkage is made and then what that does to thinking about Ramahan Roy, um, father of modern India, if in the late 19th century, we're getting this um, 
as we're all familiar with this idea of India as Bharat Mata and mm. the, the, the sort of mapping of Sati onto the space of India. Um, if Ramohan is the one who abolished the practice of Sati, but Sati becomes our model of uh, virtue, how does he become father of modern India? There's sort of almost a kind of a uh, interesting tension there. Uh, he's the one who put a stop to, or we in the popular imagination helped put a stop to the idea of a woman giving herself up in this fashion. And yet he gets to become father of modern India when at the moment when he's been um, elevated to the status of the God of Saz nation. So it's a kind of a curious question, but I appreciate thoughts. Yeah, go ahead, Emma. Do you want to um, take that? Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, Paul might have some thoughts on that as well. But um, but I think it's a really, really interesting question. Um, I mean, one thing I suppose that I didn't mention was uh, how Sati is, is very interesting as a sort of transitional icon um, between um, images and, um, and there are also plays as well around um, uh, Mother India as Bharat Bhiksha or India begging um, and you know that figure becomes prominent around the 1870s and there are sort of um, Calcutta Art Studio actually releases a print of um, India as a sort of um, haggard um, begging woman who's approaching Queen Victoria and um, offering her a, a small child who um, is a symbol of India's future and uh, Chris Pinney talks about this this image but that image of Bharat Bhiksha as a sort of, um, well, it's an image that's sort of torn between um, loyalty to Mother India and loyalty to Mother Victoria. But then by the sort of 1890s and particularly the uh, early 20th century, you have the imagery of, of Bharat Mata as superimposed on a, on a map of India. So she becomes a sort of much more of a kind of cartographic um, symbol and, and a heroic symbol. Um, so you go from sort of Mother India imagined as impoverished to Mother India as heroic, but Sati as a goddess um, is a really uh, interesting transitional figure between those two symbols, um, and um, which is not necessarily been, uh, she hasn't really necessarily been identified as a sort of transitional icon um, in that way. Um, but, to, you know, as to your question, I'm, I'm not sure I can really... Uh, fully answer your question, but I think it's a really interesting point um, about that tension between, you know, Ramahan Roy as the sort of father of India and, and everything that he rep you know, represents in terms of his, um, uh, you know, ideas around Sati and then how Sati becomes a sort of almost like a nationalist icon by the late 19th century. I don't know if, if Paul wants to um, add anything to, to that relationship. No, I, uh, other than to, to, to remind us of, of the power of images and much of the uh, writing that I've really come across on Sati has been about um, uh, text and, and uh, discourse and argument and what, uh, uh, what, you, uh, what we see in some of these images is, uh, in a sense, opens the, the, opens the gates up for uh, maybe uh, Sati being something more of a, uh, on a kind of spectrum of meanings. Uh, so that there is some uh, connection with this, with the story of Sati and the story of Daksha's sacrifice and the story of the Shakta Pitas as, as uh, the, you might say the expanded body of the goddess, uh, which is uh, in fact, the land of India that uh, um, that's already taking it beyond the Puranic myth of, of uh, Sati's uh, immolation. Uh, and then how all this gets uh, connected to uh, to 19th and 20th century uh, um, anti-colonial uh, endeavors, drawing very much on these this, these kind of folk sensibilities that uh, um, we see in the in the visual material that you you present. I love the one of the various 51 body parts. Uh, 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 sort of literally presented as. Uh, and then the uh, Shakta Pitas that I've been to, uh, 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 mainly Kamakya and uh, and some in, in uh, Uttar, uh, not in Uttar, but uh, Himachal uh, region, uh, 
there's not a lot of emphasis on sati so much as, as uh, she's already now transformed into a form of the Devi and has a whole other mythology that may be connecting her to that more local context. Uh, but so uh, I apologize for going over too long, but I hope I haven't closed any, anybody out who wants to participate. No, not at all. Um, Ima, if I can just add a word or two, um, you know, this uh, image that you described of Bharat Bhiksha, uh, that is a very, very uh, prevalent um, image in Bengali poetry in the 1870s. Himchandra uh, Bandapadhyay, there's a whole, um, so I've written, because I've written about Bengali poetry in the 19th century, I've dealt with this image of uh, Bharat as this wretched mother uh, you know, um, uh, appealing to queen, uh, to the queen, or remonstrating with the with the queen. Uh, you know that you do not look after your subjects. It's 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 very very prevalent in poetry. So so just to point out that there is uh, a relationality between the literary sphere and the visual uh, sphere that uh, that you're talking about. Uh, that's one. And the other one really was a, a just to mention a little bit of discomfort. In fact, at the juxtaposition of the two images, one of Nondulal, Nondulal's Shuti and the other of the Litho of 1883. And I was thinking to myself, why does this make me uncomfortable? And um, I think, you know, while everybody was talking and and I was thinking about it. I think it is because there, there, there's there's a development happening. If I mean that's my hypothesis at least, uh, where really you know the, the the real the real the real as in the practice of sati and the abolition of sati and actually widows burning on fires in the 18, 1830s, thirties eighteen twenty nine eighteen thirty and this later moment in the nineteenth century when it is becoming figurative. And by the time we reach uh, Nandulal, it is it, it really the it is it is such a such a beautiful painting that 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 all that comes to me from it is the formal elements of it, the the, the wash technique, the, what they are taking from Japan and Okakura, and how that entire uh, canvas is sort of illuminated, you know, almost by that by the shimmering quality of 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 you know the 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 robes and the and the flames. So so really, when I look at it as, as as, as a 21st century Indian or a 20th century Indian, I, ca I can see only the, the, the beauty of Nandula's very modernist uh, art. Uh, whereas the Litho, of course, is a different thing entirely and is, is belongs to popular culture. And, and that sort of juxtaposition sort of then, I was thinking whether it is to do really with the transformation of of it into something figurative rather than so from the practice of sati itself to the figurative the symbolic and because of there's so much you, you mentioned jahar and padmini of course uh, uh, you know abunindranath himself uh, writes rajkahini and rajkahini has some of the most sort of you know a spine tingling accounts uh, for bengali school all bengali school children of the the you know of the rani puddini uh, myth and 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 that legend uh, so so really, it's becoming uh, uh, something that exists on the pages of literature and in art in a in a more figurative and symbolic way now, and and then then I think the previous three, the entire correspondence between Bentinck and Wilson, mm -hmm. which is a, of a different tone and tenor altogether, yeah. that, that just a thought that came from everything that yeah yeah. yeah. But yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Are there, I'm sorry to have taken so much time. No, in Are fact, any... Jyoti Indranath Tagore wrote, yeah. wrote a play, Shorojini. Shorojini, was, yeah, exactly. And Shorojini had, yes. Depicts the entire story of yes, this Jawa. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and one of the most uh, sort of popular plays of Girish Kosh had this, actually, he, uh, he got the sort of flames to to you know be lit on stage and this was one of the most mm. uh, sort of uh, uh, that the drew the maximum amount of audiences numbers of audiences the actresses actually leapt into these embers uh, uh, when they were reenacting all of this yes so in drama in poetry in 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 the visual arts yes certainly this is being uh, reenacted re remembered uh, but in a in a in a figurative and symbolic uh, mode, perhaps from the early, earlier, earlier discussion on it. So yeah, I think that's that was really that's so interesting what you said, and there is a really strong relationship between these popular prints and the theatrical productions. So 
the, the, the play by um, Girish Chandra that you mentioned um, probably inspired that uh, Calcutta Art Studio print of uh, Shiva carrying Sati and was probably inspired by a scene from, from that specific play because I think they, the play came out around the exact same time, around 1883. So, and that, so there is that very strong relationship between drama and you know, the, the popularity of theatre productions at the time and these circulating popular prints. So that's, that's fascinating. Thanks very much for, for raising that. I was also very interested in why in oh, it is, I think, only in Bengal, or is it all over India? I think the, the scholars of religion will be able to, uh, you know, will, will know better. But why is Sh Shiva always pot-bellied? <laughs> all, of, all of the Bengali, all of the old Bengali images have him with a lovely little pot belly. Uh, he's, he's this, he has this tummy, uh, which I don't think, I mean, of course, it's vanished from 20th century India. You don't, you know, like you, now he has a six pack. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was, I was, I was, I've always been very curious. Why, why, why had the Bengalis always imagined him to, it's something to do with his, I think, the Bengali understanding of his self-indulgence, all that mm -hmm. pang and all that. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> yeah. the ancient, uh, the poetries of oh, no, oh, no, the Mongol and all that where they describe. Yeah, it's Bharat Chandra and uh, <laughs> yes. And I think it's the vernacular Shiva of Bengal, the domesticated Shiva, yes. his ganja smoking and his laziness. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, with, uh, with that, we're sort of going completely off course. I'm really, really <laughs> <laughs> really sorry um, to, to do that too and we are now sort of you know the numbers are decreasing because the time we, we sort of really run run over time but thank you very much thank you professor Portright. uh thank you uh, uh dr ramos thank you so much for uh, uh being with us here today and thank you to a very involved audience as well uh professor killingly uh professor zastupil brian thanks thank thanks you. thanks thanks for being here. yeah thanks everyone thank yeah. you thanks Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you, everybody. So we'll end it here. Uh, I will share the recording. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amit. Thank you. Good see you all. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. Nice evening. <laughs>